I learned a lesson this time to wait for the kids to get about three quarters of the way through. Because last time, I about got taken out. So I, I learned a lesson this, uh, this time. Hey, uh, glad to see you this morning. Uh, like, like Pastor Landon said, my name is Jeremy Dooley. I am the student and admin pastor here. And so, uh, yeah, you're, I, I was told not to say this, but it, to me it makes me laugh. I call myself the JV team, okay? So here's why. If you're a guest this morning, I'm going to preface it as always with this. If you're a guest, like it's our two-part way to get you to come back. Like you heard me and you go, everything was awesome except that guy. Well, then come back next week. You'll like Pastor Landon, okay? So uh, glad you are here this morning. We're in, we take a break from time to time, and we do this series called We Believe. And it's things that as a church that, well, eloquently named, we believe. And so we've gone through over the last couple of years. And first of all, can y'all imagine, we've had Pastor Landon for two years. This has been two years. It, it's time has flown. And uh, for the last two years, we've gone through these things right here. Membership, covenant, evangelism, deacons, worship, giving, missions, elders, marriage, to name a few. And this morning we are looking at our job as believers is to reach our city with the gospel. That we are all missionaries of the gospel. In, in North, I'm from North Carolina where God lives. And uh, I'm just kidding. And uh, I, I'm from there. And so if a Christian moves from North Carolina to South Carolina, do you, we, you know what we call them? We call them missionaries. Okay? Like, in my notes, I had written an Oklahoma joke in, because I, but I'm not a Texan. I can't, and I met a really sweet lady from Oklahoma. Are you from Oklahoma? Well, okay, I'm sorry. And, and I won't mock Oklahoma, because I met this awesome sweet lady, and I was like, I, I can't make fun of her state, because she was really sweet. So if you're from Oklahoma, you're safe. If you're from South Carolina, we'll talk about Jesus in the lobby at the end of the day. But, hey, listen, but our job as believers is to be on mission. That we don't just show up to church, we don't just hear God's word read, we don't just hear it proclaimed. In the book of James it says, don't just hear it, don't just read it, but do what it says. And so if we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, we believe as a body that we are to reach our city, that we are to make every effort to reach our community for Christ. In fact, we believe it so much that we want to expand this space that you're in because so many of you are reaching the community already with the gospel and you're bringing people in with you and we want to expand with this city that, as it's growing. But we also want to remember that we have a job to do. And it's in all facets of our life to boldly proclaim the gospel. If you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Jeremiah chapter 4, or chapter 29, excuse me, verse 4 through 7 is where we're going to be. Stand for the reading of God's word. Verse 4 says this, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles who I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word this morning, God, I pray that we will not hear the mere words of man, God, but we will hear your gospel boldly proclaimed this morning. God, that we will leave here different than the way we came in, that we will leave here living lives on mission, and we will boldly proclaim your gospel to the world that we come in contact with. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we get to chapter 29, there, there's a lot that has come before it. Uh, this week as I was studying the book of Jeremiah, I, I really enjoyed studying it for, a, a num for numerous reasons. But one is I, I had never actually, I think I'd read through the book of Jeremiah, but I'd never just sat and really just digested all of the richness of it. And in Jeremiah 1, we see God anoint Jeremiah a prophet to the people of Israel and also to the world. And so God anoints Jeremiah. Jeremiah is anointed a prophet, but he goes his entire ministry with only two converts. Jeremiah's ministry is tough. It is really hard. In fact, historians call his ministry him the weeping prophet because he is constantly weeping and upset over the wickedness of the people that he is called to minister to. 
And so he spends his entire life ministering to a group of people who do not want to hear what he says. In fact, they spend the majority of their time doing the opposite of what Jeremiah is telling them God is having them do. Jeremiah is an example of patient perseverance. And after about 20 years of ministry, God tells Jeremiah, collect all of your sermons and collect them together. And so uh, Jeremiah's scribe, Baruch, collects all of Jeremiah's sermons, and then he fills in the gaps of the sermons with stories of Jeremiah's life. And so when you read the book of Jeremiah, it's the largest book in the Bible, and it reads like an anthology of Jeremiah's life. It's a collection of sermons and stories of Jeremiah's life that tell about his ministry to the people of Israel. And so the major theme that goes on all throughout the book of Jeremiah is the people of Israel are constantly breaking this covenant relationship they have with God. They give themselves to worshiping Canaanite idols. Israel's leadership forget basically the Torah. They do whatever they want to do. They've abandoned God's law. They forget to take care of widows and orphans. In fact, instead of taking care of them, they begin to take advantage of those less fortunate among them. And so in Jeremiah 7, it's called the temple sermon, Jeremiah lays out uh, basically this sermon because when he goes to the temple, the people inside the temple are worshiping God. The people on the outside of the temple are worshiping Canaanite gods and even practicing human sacrifice. So Jeremiah, on behalf of God, lets them know through this sermon in Jeremiah 7 that God will be bringing judgment down on them. And in fact, he's going to destroy the temple, and then he is going to give them over to be conquered by an army from the north if they don't stop what they're doing and repent. And the army from the north, we now know, is the empire of Babylon. And so in Jeremiah 25, King Nebuchadnezzar is his first year on the throne. And so for the first 24 chapters of the book of Jeremiah, we see Jeremiah constantly calling the people of Israel to repentance. And they constantly ignore him. They want nothing to do with what he's saying. They are fat and happy. Life is good. They are comfortable. And Jeremiah keeps calling them to repentance over and over. And they ignore him over and over. And so in chapter 25, we see this transition. We see Jeremiah tell the people of Israel, okay, King Nebuchadnezzar is on his way to conquer, and you will be in exile in the Babylonian empire for 70 years. And so when we get to chapter 29, the first wave of Israelite exiles are in Babylon. Jeremiah is in Jerusalem writing this letter to exiles who are in Babylon. And while they're there, they are hearing from false prophets who are telling the people of Israel what they want to hear. They're telling the people of Israel, God is telling us that we're not going to be here long. Like, rest easy. We're not going to be here that long. It's not going to be that big of a deal. Take your time. Hold your breath. God's going to get us out. And in Jeremiah 29, he writes this letter. And he and basically refuting what the false prophets are saying. So in verse 4, chapter 29, verse 4, Jeremiah says this in his letter to the people of Israel. Verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles who I have sent into exile from Jerusalem. So he lets them know up front, the God of Israel. See, they made a covenant with God, that God would be their God and they would be his people. And constantly, all throughout the Old Testament, you see the people of Israel breaking their covenant relationship with God. God giving them over to the punishment for their sin. They cry out to God for help. He shows up. There's a time of peace. And then they do it all over again. And all throughout the Old Testament, you see this happen. And in Jeremiah 29, it's no different. The God of Israel, he says, listen, I'm still your God. You are still my people. There's still this covenant relationship between God and the people who constantly disobey him. And then he says this phrase that I love and has been in my head all week. To all the exiles who I have sent. I've been thinking about this all week. In fact, in staff meeting on Monday, I I read it with the staff. That God sent his people into exile. That he put them there. That he put them there for a purpose. 
that it wasn't by accident. He says, I'm your God, and I put you in exile. And I think in one phrase, we see the beauty of the sovereignty of God. I put you there. It wasn't by accident. And at the flip side, we see there's peace, that God is still fully in control. He lets them know, I put you there. I'm still fully in control. And in fact, in that, we have the safety and security of, I'm the only way you're going to get out. And so we see this consequence in redemption, this providence in a plan that the God of Israel, I'm still your God, you're still my covenant people, but he's in control, even when you can't see it. And this works well in our, in our lives today. See, as Christians, we call ourselves exiles of this world. That as followers of Christ, this isn't it. That we live this life with a future that we know is in heaven in eternity with him. That we too are exiles. And I think often we forget the fact that just like God sent the people of Israel, you and I have been sent here today with a purpose. I think a lot of time we watch the news or we listen to things and we almost sometimes re- think that, you know, like God has forgotten us. That we, we look at our lives and we say, well, God, surely, like, where are you at in this moment? And we forget that God is sovereign and he has us in this time and in this place and in this space for a reason. That it's not by accident, that we have a job to do. And just like he set the people of Israel into exile, you and I live in exile today with a job, with a purpose. But what happens sometimes is we are like the people of Israel. And we look at our exile as punishment. Their exile was punishment. It was because of their sin. But God still had a plan for them in it. We can look at our exile. We can look at our time here. Sometimes like the people of Israel, they looked back on a time when they were fat, they were happy, and they were comfortable. History and nostalgia for the Christian can sometimes forget that we are here currently with a mission to do. If we constantly look in the past, there are times that are better. If we constantly are telling ourselves, well, X amount of years ago, life was better. People treated the church this way. People had Christian values then. And we look back and we see a time that was better in our minds. We'll forget that we're here with the purpose that God has a plan. And it's not like God forgets why we're here. That we've got a job. And so just like the people of Israel are in exile, we too are in exile. But just like the people of Israel, there was a purpose in them being there. There was plan and there was purpose. And for us today, in our exile, there is plan and there is purpose. And so what does this look like for us? Verse 5, he tells the people, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and eat their produce. Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. The false prophets of the day were telling them it's temporary. You're not going to be here that long. And Jeremiah says, not only did I send you there, I put you in exile. While you're there, here's what I want you to do. Get comfortable. You got 70 years of exile, plant, and not only plant roots, but prosper. Like you don't build houses if you're not going to be there that long. You don't plant gardens if you're not going to be there that long. Okay? He's not telling the people of Israel to marry the people of Babylon. He's saying, live like you would live in Jerusalem. In Jewish culture, we've talked about this before, that when you have children, if we read the Shema, what do you do? You, you teach your kids. The first thing a Jewish person would teach their kids was about who God is and about this covenant relationship they have with God, to love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. That they were to talk about him in every facet of their day. As they did life, they would be talking about who God is, this covenant relationship. He tells them, your life is there. Build houses, plant gardens, Mary, point your families to God. And in that, living lives the way God would have them live, it points the world around them to their 
God. They're called to look different in a culture that makes no sense to them, in a culture they don't want to be in. They are called to expand and to grow and to plant and to make themselves prosper. And he says, do all the things that you would do in Jerusalem. Live life, live faithfully where you are. For us, we serve this city best when we reach our community. When we truly make every effort by reaching our community for Christ, we do all the normal things with gospel intention. Whether it's our neighborhoods, whether it's our workplaces, our kids' activities, our community groups, students, in your schools. That we plant roots, that we do life best when we involve ourselves in the community. And not just for community outreach, that we involve ourselves in the world we come in contact with for the gospel. That it's intentional. That sitting at your kid's baseball practice is intentional. That you're making relationships with the gospel. In your neighborhoods, the people that live across the street, mine are really shady. It's, it's Travis and Sherry Dickinson. And constantly, I'm, I'm leaving tracks in their mailbox so they hear about Jesus. No, I'm kidding. But I have other neighbors that I'm sure need to hear about Jesus in my neighborhood. I want to make intentional relationships that point people to the gospel. In your work, you don't just show up and go through the motions. In your job, you're pointing people to Jesus. We plant roots and we prosper. That we don't just get involved in our community for community's sake. We get involved in our communities for the gospel. To build relationships that point people to Jesus. Hebrews 13, 14 says, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. That we don't have a lasting city now, but we live lives pointing to the gospel, pointing to this eternity that we find peace in, that we find rest in. 1 Peter 2, 12 says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Not only are our lives supposed to plant and take root, but they're supposed to be lives of example. That people see how we live, they see Jesus. When they see how we love our spouses, they see Jesus. When they see how we raise our children, they see Jesus. When they see our character in the way we work, they see Jesus. In all facets of how we do life, they see the gospel. 2 Corinthians 6.3, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. It's that we're living above reproach. That we're not huddling up with other believers, scared of the society that we live in. That we are actively seeking out the society that we live in. Not looking like them, but pointing them to the gospel. And he goes on a step further. Seek the welfare of the city where I sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. The word welfare in the Hebrew literally means shalom. It means peace. Seek the peace of your city. And he reminds him again, where I sent you into exile. The people of Israel in a land they don't want to be in. They're in a land where the king and his armies have probably taken many of their possessions, killed many of the people that they love, where they're no longer comfortable, and in fact, they're probably very uncomfortable, and God says, I put you there, plant roots, and then seek the peace of the people that are probably persecuting you. Seek their welfare. You've got 70 years in exile. Seek their peace. Pray for them. We live a countercultural life that seeks the welfare of those that don't look like us, and in fact, don't under stand us. That if this is our exile, there's people today that do not want to hear the gospel. In fact, they will do everything contrary to the gospel. Their lives might be in complete opposition of what you and I believe in. We constantly today are seeing people that believe like we believe being persecuted in different ways, as big and small as it might be. And we're called to love those people. We're called to seek their welfare, and we're called to pray for those people. See, as Christians, we know that true peace is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. 
and that we are called to love our neighbors as ourselves, that we put their needs above our needs, that our city would see God's power and might, that we proclaim what God is doing in our city and we can point them to the gospel and that people would see that not only with how we live lives, our lives, but we look at things, we bring them aware, we, we make them aware of how God is working in our lives, that he would see what's going on in our city and we would say we can give God credit for that. That as a Christian, we talk often about praying for those who are suffering, about doing things for those that are suffering. And I think sometimes we completely forget that the world that opposes us, we should be seeking their welfare and praying for their eternal suffering. That the people that oppose us, outside of knowing Jesus Christ, have an eternity that is separated from God. Instead of seeing them as our opposition, it should break our hearts and we should want to minister to the gospel to those people. And we would pray like Paul in Philippians 3.10, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and that, that I might share in his sufferings. See, we believe as a church that we are called to point the world to the gospel. And it's not just asking people to come into this beautiful building. That it's in every facet of our life that we intentionally point people to the gospel. So if we believe this, how do we make every effort to reach our city? One, we realize that God is sovereign. We rest in the sovereignty of God, that he has a plan, that he's put us here for a purpose and for a reason. That regardless of what we think, we can look backwards, remember a time that was once great and whatever, and, 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 but we have peace that God has us in this time and in this space for a purpose, that we rest in the sovereignty of God, that we do the normal things, that we plant roots in our city, that we, we make relationships with those we come in contact with, and we make those relationships with the intention of the gospel and wherever our life takes us. And we pray for a world that may never understand us and may never love us back. And we love that world and we seek its welfare and we seek its peace. We believe this. You see it often. We talk about missions often as a body. But it's not just global. That's one part of it. That our mission field is outside your door. That your mission field is at your kids' sporting events. Your mission field is your grandchildren. Your mission field is wherever your feet take you, you are to point people back to Jesus. That's how we reach the community with the gospel. We make everything we do intentionally focused on Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have today. God, I remember a quote by John Piper, and it says, let's live, that let's do so much good that the natives will want to meet our king. That God, while we're here, that we're not here by chance, we're not here by accident, that you have us in this time and in this place for a reason and for a purpose. And God, may we see that, may we act on that, may we look like you in all that we do. God, that we would point our community to the gospel, that we'll be bold in our faith, that we will share the saving grace of Jesus Christ that we have, that we'll be bold and we'll share it with the world that we come in contact with. God, that our lives would look that different, that the natives would see it and wonder about our Heavenly Father. God, that is our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name.